Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the founders you've heard of, some of you've never heard of. You know, I, and I was talking to John Corcoran last night, and he's like, Jeremy, the last several interviews you've done, you've given the same intro. I know, John, listen, when I talk to, about the story of, you know, P90X founder, you know, making money as a street mime, and putting his head on the street and making food and rent money, it's a crazy fun story and it demonstrates that someone everyone is just like everyone else you know and they start off and they have ups and downs and even they sell hundreds of millions of dollars of product it doesn't matter they started off on a journey and i know your eyes about that which is it's never easy it's always the journey is always kind of takes twists and turns and i said well i'll come up with something different then okay which i haven't said and so I've had the founder of Einstein Bagels, No Elper, he would sell tchotchkes out of his trunk. And I think his previous two businesses didn't do so well. He would get um, religious tchotchkes, you know, Christian tchotchkes, Jewish tchotchkes, and sell them out of his trunk before making, starting whatever, you know, 50 or 100 bagel stores and kind of combining to form what we know as Einstein Bagels. So... There you go, John. A little bit of a new intro for you. Um, and you can listen to many more interviews at inspiredinsider.com um, and, you know, about the journey, the true challenges, ups and downs. And uh, before I introduce today's guest, which is a very special guest, which I've mainly have on for a long, long time, who's going to talk about the power of story. And, you know, I and I am doing uh, right now a series on, I guess, the top givers I know the ultimate givers, the people who are just want to, is just a great human being is always giving to other people. Um, and I'm doing an, a series on top agency owners. And so you fit both of those categories. So why not Thank have you, you on? Um, but before we, I give you a proper introduction, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And Rise25, I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help you run your podcast, you know, so it generates ROI. Um, and I, and I, you've heard this story before too, is it's much more personal for me. Yes, I think podcasting is the best thing since sliced bread. I think every business should have a podcast, just like Ian thinks every business should incorporate video in your marketing and video in general for storytelling. But it's a lot more personal because um, it's was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only people of their family to survive. But you're like, what does it have to do with podcasting? Well, his words and legacy, legacy live on because the Holocaust Foundation actually did an interview with him. And that interview lives on my about page of Inspired Insider. And so people, anyone could go. For the longest time, I, and I was thinking, people would say, Jeremy, what's your motivation? Why do you, you know, which is not smart you know, maybe sleep for four hours and just are totally determined. And I thought about it for a long time, like years, and I had no idea. And it really stems from my grandfather. And I figure, and you, you and I have had this conversation before, which is the conversation goes, you know, we are so appreciative and grateful for what we have, because when you compare it to some of the other stuff that other people have gone through or have, how can you not be appreciative and grateful for that? So when I watch that interview multiple times a year, I think, oh my God, like I didn't have to live in the woods for two weeks and, or my house wasn't burned down and people were actually trying to kill us. So I watch that interview multiple times a year and I think it's not just about um, business and forming amazing relationships, it's about helping my guests leave a legacy. And so if you are thinking about doing podcasting, you should, whether you use this or not is totally up to you. Um, but go to rise25.com and check out what we're doing and you can email us there. Today's guest, I, and because it's you, maybe it's a long intro, but you know, it's you and also I'm really excited to have you. So, um, you know, today's guest is one of the top 
people I know, one of the top video marketing and content experts I know, and he's had some of the top marketers and service professionals as clients. Um, he, you can check him out at, you, know, you can go to storycruise.com, you can go giantsofvideo.com. He's literally sort of a real life giant standing <laughs> at six, seven. Um, I've yet to see his basketball, pro, you know, basketball prowess, but one day maybe we'll play. And I'm not doing, doing him full justice. He's pioneered a lot in the video marketing agency space, and he's been doing it for over a decade. He's worked with large hotel chains, to medical offices, to small businesses, to NFL Hall of Famers. And you can check out his websites at storycruise.com and giantsvideo.com. I am. Thanks for joining me. That's awesome to be here this morning. Live. Live, yeah. I just don't even pay attention. It's live. But um, – there's so many things I want to ask you and you, when you are interviewing someone who is a colleague, friend, mentor, like you can go anywhere. Right. Yep. And, um, we will talk a little bit, uh, shout out to your podcast, the garlic marketing show also, and to John Corker and smart business revolution. You know, I was listening to the interview you did with John, which was awesome. So we will talk about dolphins. Okay. So like, <laughs> <laughs> that goes without saying, but I yes. figured we'd start with appropriate, which is story, you know, which mm -hmm. links authentic web, it links giants of video, it links story crews. On the when you talk to John, you talked about three C's of story, mm -hmm. and I, I don't quite think I've heard it explained that simply before. So I wonder if you just kind of go over that and, and what that means. Sure, three C's of story. So story has to have an arc, and a um, and there's three parts to a good story. And when we tell a story, if you, if you don't have the three parts, it's not a story. Now the story can be told in one sentence. It can be a movie, but, and there can be stories within the movie, but the three parts that you've got to get are connection, conflict, and conclusion. Hmm. And so, I mean, it, people have to connect in some way, shape or form. They have to understand what's going on but also have to be drawn in. You know, we can do this through curiosity. We can do this through uh, video, you know, seeing someone that's like us or a story that we get, that we understand. Um, and then, you know, there has to be a conflict. There has to be some issues and th there can be multiple conflicts throughout it and little stories within stories, which is great. But then also, and then you have a conclusion and there has to be some sort of conclusion you know, when there when there isn't a really solid conclusion to a story, we get we get upset. I mean, look at The Sopranos. Look at a lot of these shows that kind of ended. You know, Seinfeld kind of ended like uh, that wasn't a great ending. It wasn't a great conclusion, and so we feel that, and that's why we have a reaction because if we don't conclude a story, it just doesn't work. So, and any any time you tell a story, that's what you need to do, and that's one of the things I always talk about. It's like video case stories. You know, I don't use the word testimonials because testimonials don't work. It's no one remembers a testimonial, but will remember a well-told story. Our brain thinks in stories. Yeah. You know, that's what I was going to bring up too, is you always kind of ingrained in me, don't call it a testimonial, call it a case story. And how do you, if you're working with a business or a business is creating a case story, you're helping them create a case story. Can you give me an example of one of your favorites that you helped create that had the kind of the connection, the conflict and conclusion? Uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when I, I like, you know, I like the business to business ones. You know, I've, I've seen it, you know, some of my favorites actually have been, um, you know, Tanner Larson and Build Grow Scale. He does e-commerce training. And, you know, we had some amazing, I mean, you should definitely check it out because some of the stories on there, and I just did a bunch last year with him at their event. And, you know, from Anna's case story, Anna Sasanto to Christopher Smith. Yeah. These, Talk these, about one of them that struck you and maybe we can weave in how connection, the conflict and conclusion um, kind of overlays to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so Anna's is a perfect one because I mean, and, and I feel bad because <laughs> I use it all the time, but I, I love it. And she's an amazing, amazing person. But she talks about how she was struggling as a graphic designer, a single mom, 
um, struggling to make ends meet, struggling to get out there in the world and side on e-commerce. And it was kind of floundering around. Um, and, you know, so there's right there, there's the conflict and the connection all in a sentence. And she gets more depth into it. But then she, she finds Bill Grove Sikale. She finds uh, Tanner's groups and has used that and start to implement those things and start to implement things within the masterminds that he had and start to implement it and change her life. And it changed her business. And she then had, you know, now she has, you know, a, I think she just talked about it. she hit nine figures last year. Holy cow. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and so see the difference. What, what, what kind of products does she sell? You remember? Uh, I, uh, I mean, she sells a lot of different products, mm. you know, for, uh, she, yeah, she does a lot of graphic design stuff, but the point being is like, I really didn't talk about Tanner at all. I, I mean, I, I mentioned him. I didn't talk about how great his systems were. I talked about her story and right there we can feel it. There's an emotional reaction and she gets emotional in it. You can see it in her face. If you, if you're asking this the right way, and that's why people call me out to do this. If you're asking the questions the right way, and if you really dig deep, Everyone has a story and you can find that emotion in there and that dramatic arc. What was it you remember that struck her so much or that helped her get results with his program? Um, I mean, it was everything, right? It, it, it was the coaching. It was ac actionable stuff. It was that they were constantly changing stuff. It was that he was bringing other experts in for motivation. It was, it was a bit of everything. But, you know, those those features aren't as important as the, you know, the ultimate transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some questions that you ask yourself or your clients on how do you, like you said, there's an art and a science to getting the story and helping mm -hmm. someone, drawing the story out of them. And you are really good at that. What are some questions that people should consider asking themselves if they're creating it or... Mm -hmm. uh, someone else, maybe on an interview. Well, if you're, if you're creating it before you start doing this, you should always be thinking of what is your goal here with this story, right? Where, who are you talking to and where are they in their journey? Because people decide, you know, there's an incredible book out there called the person in the situation. It's a, it's a sociology, psychology book, social psychology book. I, I think it's what they call it. Uh, but basically th there's a thing called the fundamental attribution error. That we think people decide because of who they are. And they actually decide because of the moment, you know, whether it's late at night or early in the morning, mm. you know, if we're driving the kids to school, if someone calls you and tries to sell you while you're driving the kids to school, you'll hate them. But if it, they're just trying to sell you something that you need right then, you, mm. you're like, okay. It's all about timing. Yeah, it's all about timing because it's, it's because of the situation that we're in. We're constantly in flux. So first of all, you have to understand who you're speaking to, what their situation is, that scene. You know, and this is what we do in our, our storyboard blueprint sessions with uh, clients is we go through each of the individual scenes. And once you know what scene you need to tell it in, then you figure out what stories you need. And then you're looking to craft those stories um, and you're looking to find those stories. So, uh, you know, uh, we always think about, well, the conversion point, right, where it's like someone becomes a customer. I need stories that sell, stories that sell. But what about the stories that draw attention? Yeah, those are going to get people earlier on. And those are going to be different than the stories that about, um, uh, you know, where things go wrong. And the, those are going to be stories different than the stories about long term success. Those are going to be different than the stories about your process, which is important, too. So you need to have all the stories, but you need to figure out which stories you want to get out first and go find them. Um, mm -hmm. th then to your point, we want to be asking questions about that. But there's two critical things. Now you ask stories about, you, ask, you want to create questions about the connection, who they are, what's unique about them. So, and especially things that match up to your ideal client. Um, so that's why it's important. And asking things about that situation, right? Uh, that they're in. So those match up as much as possible. And the conflict, what's the problem that they have? So you want to be asking questions about the conflict. Um, but, the probably once you get those things down and the conclusion, you want as much detail as possible about how you did that in the conclusion, both long term or both short term and long term. Like, what was it like when it first ended? And what is it like now that is a year later? What's life like now? Um, it, 
But then the biggest, probably the most powerful thing is the two words I always say is moments and emotions is what was that moment that you felt that? Because a lot of people are like, oh yeah, it worked out well. But what was the moment that you knew that worked well? Hmm. What was that moment? And how did that feel? So once you start asking those questions and really ask them in the right way, because there's, you know, there's a time and place you shouldn't, the, these are the types of questions that you shouldn't be just asking off a piece of paper, right? You need to have a conversation with the person because when you're just like, okay, what was the moment that you knew that that felt and what was the, and how, <laughs> you, you know, and, and what you're not going to elicit a great response. If you're not going to elicit like a response. That. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you got to care about the person that you're talking to and have a conversation with them. Hmm. Um, but yeah, those those are two. I mean, in summary, the two keys to add, the questions you should ask yourself, you know, and we actually say that about every video we make. There's four questions you should be able to answer about every video you make. Who are we talking to? Where are they in the journey? Why should they pay attention to this? And what do we want them to do next? Hmm. I love it. Yeah, you're a serious planner. And how is this going to be used? Where are you going to put, even you get granular on where are you going to put this? Are you going to put this on YouTube? Are you going to put this on your website? Are you going to put this on Facebook, right? Yeah. Yeah. You got to plan. I mean, they're different platforms. We absorb information different. You know, YouTube people watch with sound. They'll watch in large format. You don't need to have text overlays. You want something a little more cinematic on Instagram stories is vertical. You can you probably, you know, people watch those without sound. So you're going to want something that engages people visually, but also, you know, some area for text. So we want to think through that and also how condensed that story needs to be at that point. Hmm. Yeah. And a shout out to um, Dean Dutro at Worthy Commerce. They basically help do tell stories. Um, they help e-commerce companies grow through controlling their email sequences and telling stories through email sequences. And we were talking about this the other day, I, and you totally appreciate this because they said, you know, it depends where someone's at in their customer journey, right? If they're just getting it, they want may want longer form information. If they're ready to buy something, maybe they just want a short email with just the link. And that just made me think, you know, the same thing goes for video, right? Oh, and yeah. It's the same. You need to hit them, hit someone. I don't mean that in any other connotation with what they want at that moment. Exactly. That People always ask me, I've made a few videos on this. How long should this video be? I'm like, well, you have to answer those four questions because, uh, and also if you're putting it on YouTube, it should be a lot longer. It should be as long as you can get someone to pay attention because YouTube, it, it, that they reward that view time. Whereas Facebook, maybe you want them to really quickly move over to someplace else off of Facebook because you don't want them getting distracted. You've got to be thinking about those things and plan your videos accordingly. Because I see so much of people, the biggest mistake that people make in video and video marketing is they think a filmmaker is a video, is a videographer or a video marketer. Mm -hmm. And most, and that's why we develop story crews because we're training videographers, we're training uh, editors to think like marketers. And that there's a big difference, huge difference. What's the Other, difference? I mean, it's the difference between under, understanding how to build value and the and the understand your audience versus building making something just pretty right i mean it's the difference between i always use this analogy but it, you know if you've heard me before it's the difference between the adventures of pluto nash and paranormal activity <laughs> paranormal <laughs> adventures you remember adventures of pluto nash no it was an Eddie Murphy movie that was in like 2001 was 250 million dollars. So now you're talking like probably half a billion dollar movie that and obviously you don't remember it. But Paranormal Activity was was a, I think sub $50,000 movie, but they knew their audience, they knew how to tell a story, they knew the moment what was going on in the world and they made, I, I want to say something like $150 million in the box office. I, it's probably a lot more than that. I could, it, you know, I'm, I'm off right now, but there's the difference, right? That's the difference between filmmaking, Ventures, Pluto and Ash had all the right filmmakers and someone that understands marketing. And, and I was just talking to Daniel Harmon. He's, uh, he's one of the guests on Giants of Video uh, on our, our uh, video summit. And we talk exactly about this because he's like, 
nothing scarier than a client coming to me with a video and say, and me not having any data, not understanding the market. And he's like, I just can't do that. Whereas filmmakers will readily do that because I mean, because they're tailoring the message and the content to that specific audience. Yeah. I mean, his, he, he teaches on the seminar, uh, exactly how they test every single part of this before they make the whole video. That's a marketer versus a filmic. Now they make really cool, really good looking. Yeah. Videos. Have you seen the purple mattress videos? Yeah. And what are some of the other ones? Poopery. Oh, so Poopery, Squatty Poppy, the last squatty one. Potty. My, my uh, kids love that Squatty Potty where the oh, yeah. big poops out like ice cream, rainbow ice cream. Yeah. They keep um, watching that. But and they have, I forget the grill one. All those are awesome. They're hilarious. But, you know, he talks about it. It's like you think business and data first. And that's important. And so here's where the big, here's where I see this all the time. Because I know so many people, they call me up. I just want a video for this. I just want a video that tells my story. I'm like, all right, who's, what do you want to do? I'm not sure. You know, get me clients. Where are you going to use it? Oh, everywhere. I'm like, <laughs> and, and, and there, I'm like, well, we need to go through strategy first. Oh, no, I, I just want this video done. And then they go to a filmmaker. And then a year later, I'm like, oh, how'd that video do? Ah, uh, we didn't really, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Usually like, he probably doesn't see the light of day though, right? I mean, it, sometimes it does. It does nothing. It's hard. It's hard enough when you have someone like Daniel Harmon, when you have someone like myself, I've produced thousands of videos and look at the data constantly. And we still, I was having this discussion with him. You don't know what's going to work, but you have an educated guess. That's hard enough. I mean, how much data I look at on a daily basis and you too, like when you write content, when you guys are, you know, creating podcast episodes, you don't know what's going to click. You have an educated guess. And we start there, but that's hard enough when you're that much of an expert. Now, if you're not an expert in marketing and you're, and you're hiring someone who's not an expert in marketing, you, you know, you, you might as well just, you know, have your six year old make the video and probably be more successful. So I want to talk, you know, I saw a couple of people popping in um, the uh, great thing about doing it live. I saw Walter Salubro pop in and I know he's big into YouTube. He's always looking for amazing YouTube tricks or tips or whatever. So I figured, I know you have a lot of them. You've taught me uh, some. Um, so I want you to talk about some of the things you've learned on YouTube. What pe Maybe some of the do's and don'ts of mm -hmm. what you see people doing or what you're actually doing uh, with YouTube. I mean, YouTube right now, it's, you know, you have to decide, first of all, what your goal is, right? Some people want to build a channel. You might have an intent-based goal, meaning like when we work with a professional, we want that video to be ranking for intent. Like I don't, we have videos that maybe have 50 views, but have made $300,000 because on the end of that is a service. So if there's high intent. So I think that's the, I mean, number one thing, like we just talked about, what is your goal? And don't have your goal be just views, right? right? Have that's your, just a vanity metric. It's a vanity metric. It, I mean, it's a metric if you want to monetize it. I don't know many people that monetize YouTube channels without having some back end offer, right? I mean, there's something else going on there. You're definitely not making money just off of YouTube views. And it's a lot faster and it's a lot easier to make it in a lot of other ways. So if you have intent, if you have SEO intent, you know, view, but no matter what view time is important. And the number one trick to getting view time mm. is, is awesome storytelling. And that's it. I mean, we had, uh, we had a video ranking in Google search results for one of the most competitive terms out there, federal criminal defense lawyer. Um, and it was number one in Google search results. So, you know, anytime someone watched that, that's like a $150 click sometimes. Yeah. And so, so and people are neglecting that. They're maybe like going after a blog post and comment, not thinking of ranking a video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rank a video. Um, rank, you know, think about YouTube, second most used search engine. So thinking of intent there is important, you know, and what your end goal is. You know, if you're just trying to get views, that's fine. And you have to pump out a lot of content on YouTube. If you think you're going to win with 10 videos, 20 videos, it's just not, if that's your only way of getting it, that's another way. And 
also be thinking about using YouTube. One of the things I'm doing now is using YouTube. I think YouTube, YouTube subscriptions is the next email list. So instead of trying to get people to subscribe to my email, I'm getting them to subscribe to YouTube. Why? Because YouTube will email my clients and tell them, hey, or my subscribers and tell them, hey, I posted a video. Mm. It will po it'll pop up if you're using Chrome. And also then it will also be suggesting it on the side if you've subscribed. So uh, it, uh, you'll be seeing my face. You'll be hearing my voice over the trust over increases. Over yeah. I mean, it, you can't help that. And that's part of the, the amazing part about video is more someone hears your your voice and sees your face. It's called the mere exposure effect. So the more they hear it, the more they see it, the more they like you. They can't control it. They can't control it. You might say, oh, I don't like that person. But when push comes to shove, if you saw that person in real life, you would feel like you know them. And I talk about this all the time. I mean, who's the ultimate female influencer in the United States? I mean, of all time. Oprah. Right now. Oprah, right? Why is she famous? Why do we, why is she influential? She's not, she, if she promotes a book, it goes number one. She promotes a skincare product, a toy, anything. If she, Oprah says it, it's like, it's platinum, right? Right. And why? Why? Because she was on TV every day for years. Yeah. So that's, that's the key. Um, because that mere exposure effect and, and you know what and it even cascaded down dr oz yes he's a surgeon but he's telling everyone how to eat he doesn't have a degree in in you know in any of this stuff <laughs> he's by far not he's not board certified in nutrition but because he was on oprah's show and then had his own show we all know like and trusted him and we'll buy all day from him i you know i want to talk about um, some of the other things in YouTube, but we, you know, John and I use the example all the time, Rise 25 with Oprah, because, you know, what does she do? She, she's on video, like you said, she's on TV. Um, she also profiles other people doing mm -hmm. interviews, which is what you do with the podcast, right? Yep. And so it increases and helps you build authority. It also helps you build connections. But talk about the gaining subscribers for a second. Are there any insights into gaining subscribers that you've seen for people? and you can give a, a shout out to any uh, top experts that you've seen um, or that you follow on YouTube also. Oh yeah. So um, Jesse Munch, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name. Sorry, Jesse. Uh, he has a, like, he has a uh, podcast, uh, YouTube uh, basketball oh, okay. uh, show. I always watch the, the professor yeah. on YouTube. Can't yeah. Get enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, millions of, of views. So he talks about it. He's going to be on the Giants of Video uh, Marketing Summit. Nice. And, you know, he got millions of, he's built that up slowly. And then he just, his wife, he crushed it with his wife. And she has like 500,000 views on some of her videos wow. with no advertising. And um, how do you and, do that? I mean, it's, it's, getting, you have to check out giants of video to count the final. No, out. well, no, and for, it's a few things. It's, it's quality stuff, right? You have to you have to ask for the subscription. You have to make sure it's easy and tell them what the benefit is. Just don't say subscribe. Say, hey, if you want this, this, and this, subscribe. Mm. Call right? to action is benefit driven. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What if, you know? One of my things I always hate is like when people say, "Check out my video." I'm like, no, why? Why? That's uh, like that's uh, that's pet peeve of mine. But um, good thing so, I gave a reason for people to check out Inspired Insider with a few examples. Or I would have been reamed out after this. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. You give specific examples. You show them super sure. Hey, if you want to get content like this, and I'm going to, I'm testing some new stuff out. So I'll come back on, but uh, make sure it don't have multiple calls to action. If you want to get some YouTube subscriptions, put it in your email, put it on your Facebook, drive other stuff to it. But that is your goal. Don't yeah. try and get them to, oh, either opt into my email or pop into my Facebook or follow me on Instagram. Uh, you know, get the YouTube subscription. Um, Dallas Golden says hello, by the way. And let's just say, let's make up a hypothetical person and company like, let's call the person Tony Grubmeyer from Ship Offers. Say <laughs> Tony Grubmeyer from Ship Offers wanted to get more YouTube subscribers. What would he do? Uh, what video should he create and what would he do to get more YouTube subscribers for ship offers? 
Well, you know, I, you know, first of all, you have to, you create like thought leadership pieces. Yes. But also remember that YouTube is intent. People are going there to learn stuff. So you have to get specific technicals as well, like how to videos, how to do this, how to do that. Um, you know, if you're going to find most of them are how to's or unboxings, that kind of thing hmm. uh, will get views. And it'll get longer views. What, um, what unboxing should they do? Are there I mean, any products? I don't know how well you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, unbox any other products and show the boxing. You know, for them, packaging is a big deal. Hmm. Showing how a package is unboxed because they, they it's very meta because of ship offers, right? So that kind of thing. Is there a way that them. you would recommend them drive? customers doing unboxings somehow or would you recommend them doing unboxings of their products i mean both user created content uh once again i'm, I'm gonna make a plug for giants of video but i i went and found the experts that's what i want to find is i i'm good at a lot of this stuff there's people that are experts at it and nahal i think have you had nahal on the show no um nahal who's facebook ad pros is talks about is going to talk about user created content hmm. um so, you know, that's the kind of thing I would definitely have his clients showing their, their boxes, mm. showing the unboxings. Um, yeah. You know, what else? How, he's, he's commenting saying, yes, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> how to detailed skills, not just thought leadership stuff. Detailed, like Tony has a journal, how to use each part of the journal, right? How to use so the this, unboxing and then. Once yeah. you unbox it, teaching the high how to videos for them. Yeah, make a series on how to. And the next one is this, and the next one is this, and the next one is this. Hey, make sure to subscribe. So when I post the next one on uh, and it's gonna be this that you watch, right? Hmm. You should definitely do that with his journal. But also like how how to um, set up the software, right? How to make sure you're getting your returns right. How to make sure that right now that your your supply chain is in the right place. You know, when we I mean then we can talk about like Fabricio who's making those. You know, he's making uh at Fleber. They're making awesome videos about you know thinking through the you know supply chain and those type of things, and then getting detailed into it because people want detail, they want specificity, but you want to make those longer too. So you'll get them, you make them longer. You want to draw it out. You don't want to tell them right up front, unfortunately, and people get frustrated with this, but that view time is so important to YouTube. Hmm. What if I and someone starting with zero subscribers? Is there any way to like jumpstart that? I mean, you can use ads. Okay. You, you can definitely use ads. It's cheap. Three, four cents a view. Really? Just get really, really specific into what you want people to subscribe to right don't be think you're gonna be the next tony robbins or gary vaynerchuk right away you know well, it, it took I, them decades to get to where they are it, right it decades i yeah. tell that story you know because i had gary on a couple years ago and we talked about it you know gary started out gary's another person that's famous only because of video right it, but he makes tons and tons of it he's a machine but when he started out, I was actually a customer of Wine Library. And I got this YouTube video where this guy is tasting, but he, he made it funny. He made it different. And, you know, and yeah, if you haven't checked those out, Wine Library TV, you could still find them on YouTube. And it's him spitting the wine into like a Jets bucket yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. And it was this giant, like, it was this white table and like his mom's sheet in the background. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? But it was YouTube. So it was like, it was novel. But he still pumped the stuff out. Um, and that's uh, the other part of it. He's just constantly pumping out quality content. And he's gotten to the point now where he doesn't have to be specific because he's such a thought leader and an inspiration to people that he doesn't have to be specific. But if you look at the quality, like anyone that has a lot of followers, they have specificity in what they educate on. Mm -hmm. So and, before and we move on, any other YouTube tips, tricks, well, you, I don't know if you want to touch on the ad piece. If someone's thinking, well, is it worth exploring or not worth exploring? I've thought about it. I've heard about it. I've seen it. You know, we've seen it a million times. Um, 
what are your thoughts on people doing YouTube ads? I think if you, especially if you have a back end offer, if you think you're going to grow a million dollar business just off of YouTube and you don't, and you're like, I'm going to make, you know, organically. YouTube, well, well, you can do it organically, but if you don't have a back end offer, right. Um, and it comes back to that customer journey. If you're, if you can make, if you have a customer and you know their journey, you can make videos along the way. If you can get your face and voice in front of them over and over again for mm -hmm. a few cents, right? It, th yeah, they might not become a customer for three years. Yes, it is a long game, but I guarantee those prices are going to go up, all right? And it's going to cost you more and more and more to get in front of them, whereas you get in front of them right now and stay in front of them with retargeting and build up this audience, especially if you have a local business, it's a no-brainer. You just be in front of them all the time. I mean, we look here in Orlando at John Morgan. I was growing up, John Morgan was on the TV. Like if you stayed home and you watched, you know, cause back then you had to watch like, you know, the UHF channels because it was either soap operas or like reruns on UHF. So I'd, if I was homesick, you'd watch it. And it was just John Morgan, John Morgan, John Morgan, John Morgan. To the point where he became the only name in personal injury in central Florida. And now, you know, throughout the world, he's one of the biggest names. And it was simply because of seeing his face over and over and over again. He didn't have to provide value because we had to watch. We could have fast forward. Now yeah, I put Tony to G's face up on here. I don't know if you can see that. It says, I like and trust you both. So <laughs> shout out to you. Um, but the – so the YouTube ads, have you seen one out there that maybe should, people should check out on YouTube? Like if you, if you Google it or is there one that you've liked in particular that pe people should check out maybe the structure or, uh, or the – the way they do it, or if you maybe want to just explain a couple of the components that people should include in a YouTube ad if they're creating one. I mean, it's, I mean, once again, I think customer mm. stories are the best ones. Mm. You know, so not you, having even you on it, having a customer yeah. story. Well, that's the first one you get. And then you retarget into informational videos, informational yeah. stuff. I mean, uh, Tom Breeze is an expert at it. Mm -hmm. um, Tanner did some great ones to fill up his event at Bill Grow Scale, which is an awesome e-commerce event. So, I mean, those are all per, uh, great examples of using YouTube. But you can, even if you're tr trying to promote a podcast, you can pull clips out and go, hey, you know, if you pull a really great clip of you interviewing someone and put it in front of there, and, you know, if you want to watch this whole interview, click here and send them over to your video. You'll at giantsofvideo dot com i mean who's going to be there specializing in talking about youtube or youtube uh, ads anyone i've got tom breeze coming mm -hmm. so i mean tom breeze is the one of the biggest ones out there um and jake larson is coming on too so uh jake larson and tom breeze so those will be uh two awesome ones um and, and then you know organic we have jesse munch coming on he's going to talk about youtube as well and he's going to talk about organic mm. uh, YouTube. And I'll be talking about it as well. You know, there's so much to talk about. And I can't believe. So you have until you have like 20 more minutes, right? I have 20 more minutes. Okay. Okay. It's not enough time. Never enough time. We need like four more hours. But, you know, you mentioned before going back to the storyboard blueprint. And if anyone has a chance to do a blueprint call with Ian, they're paid calls. They're not free nor should they be because he delivers tremendous value and whatever he charges, whenever you're listening to this, you should pay him because it's totally worth it. <laughs> and if he, Just give me you your know, money. <laughs> no, I'm being serious. Like John and I have gone through it and for our business and it was mind blowing. And I tell people, whatever Ian says, I follow. If he says jump, I just say how high, because every time I listen to him, it helps my business. It helps my relationships. And he was one of the people, him and Jason Swank were like, you need to implement a blueprint, you know, to deliver as much value as humanly possible to someone before fully working with you. So they could just see, wow, this, what these people do, they've already, you know, actually created so much value for me. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about your storyboard blueprint. We talked in the beginning a little bit about it, but yeah, what are sure. some elements that you like to cover in that? Well, I mean, we walk through, we understand the client. Well, I mean, why understand. even have a blueprint? You have a separate course that people can get on blueprints. Yeah, uh, we just did a five-day workshop. 
It was pretty intense. Um, and we're going to be re-releasing it after Giants of Video. Uh, but it's so why do it? Uh, because you don't, you know, if you can get your messaging down, if you can understand your customer, if you can answer <laughs> the client, uh, if you can answer what they're thinking at each moment in time, and you can be there all along the customer journey, right? Like boom, boom, boom. Imagine if you could be in the car, in the kitchen, in the house, in the bedroom with your ideal customer, not in that way, but you know, yeah. I mean, unless you have a different kind of business, that's a whole different story. But um, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> but imagine you can be there every time, just giving them advice. Who do you think they're going to go to when it comes time for your service? And even with other services, who are they going to go to? You, right? You. So that's why if you can be there every step in the journey. Now, being there doesn't mean, oh, look at my podcast. You know, look at Rise Twenty Five. You got to get a podcast. Look at Rise Twenty Five. You got to get a podcast. No, you got to be serving them teaching them what they need, teaching them what you can teach them, serving them, be, them hearing your voice, seeing your face. And when you provide value over and over again, that's when you become the only choice. You become an authority and a friend. And who do we buy from authorities and friends? You know, you buy from, one of my favorite quotes is when all else is equal, you buy from a friend. And when all else is still not equal and the, your friend charges more and gives, delivers less value, you still are going to buy from that friend. And that's what video can do if you're there along the journey. And so that said, you know who exactly who you're talking to exactly as a person, what they want, what they need. And then we understand their journey, each step, each scene of their journey. And inside that scene, we know what they want and need. And what's awesome about this is then we go, okay, what's the content we need to deliver? You know, what are their excuses for taking action? What are the stories we can deliver there? Um, in each of these scenes. And now, where are they? Where? What's the platform? We end with platform. So now we have a whole list of content, a whole list of stories that we need to make for each of those scenes. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Each of those scenes is also part of driving traffic, you know, leads, conversion. And, you know, one of my favorite things I talk about and we don't think about either is when they become a customer. And Joey Coleman, who I think might come on, I hope Joey, if you're watching this, you're, you're going to come on uh, the Giants of Video. Uh, it's one of the favorite, my favorite things I learned, you know, at, when we were working with Jason Swank at his mastermind. But a five percent increase in customer satisfaction can lead to a twenty-five to one hundred percent increase in profits. Hmm. I said that really fast, but a five percent increase. I had a client a while ago at the in the last recession who was in financial advisor and was putting out videos every week. Didn't lose a single client. I just mm -hmm. had Chris Martinez on Giants of Video. They not only this month, April, didn't lose a client, right? The Giants of Video, they didn't lose a client. They gained clients in April. Mm -hmm. Chris Martinez, awesome. He talks about how his video strategy for doing that. Um, but that's the blueprint allows you to know what content and always be able to go there. So you're not starting over. You can quickly adapt because when all this stuff happened with COVID and whatever, I was quickly able to go, okay, who's your ideal customer? What are their questions at this moment? And go with clients and boom, 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 figure out the videos that they need to make. And we actually shot a bunch remotely using a few tools and we're able to quickly make videos and structure them properly. Because that's another thing, too, is you can't just make videos. You have to structure them properly to engage them, to have an emotional response, to have tell stories properly, have a proper call to action. So you can be ready with that. So that's what we do through the blueprint process. Make that whole list of videos, the whole list of how they should be structured, and then an execution plan for those. So it's like boom, boom, boom. And then where do they go? Instead of going, hey, I'm going to make videos for Facebook. Which, <laughs> right? Yeah, so... P Giants of Video, it's a free virtual summit. Yep. People are, can check it out. Yep. Okay. So Giants check it video. out. Yep. I wanted to talk about Story Cruise a little bit and why you created it and who's it for. All right. So Story Cruise, there's this problem. Uh, you know, we, we would hire videographers and people like, oh, do you know a videographer? I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And they wouldn't know. And I'm like, well, and then we'd hire videographers and they want to understand business. They want to understand marketing. So if we just sent them out, even if we had a list of questions, they didn't get what we were doing. And so I realized that, you know, because I didn't start 
as a filmmaker. I started as a business person and a marketer. And I started Authentic Web, our video agency, with my wife as, you know, with knowing business, knowing marketing, and realizing video was the tool versus starting with, you know, the video. So what the businesses need video. It's and now more than ever, because of everything that's happened, we need to be on video. And I was just listening to some awesome stories today about, you know, puppet businesses that are about to go out of business now start video and are doing puppet shows. And there was a digital marketer story about, you know, you know, a digital marketing or, uh, you know, someone that's having birthdays and all of a sudden moved to video. And now they've transformed their business. That's so cool because, you know, 12 years ago, kind of saw that coming and now it happened. It we forced have, them. Yeah. It forced them to do that. Um, but these people, the businesses don't know how to, when they hire a videographer, don't know how to speak to them, don't know what to ask. And it's expensive, which it should be. A good filmmaker should be expensive because there's a gear, there's setup, there's pre-production, there's production, there's post-production, there's editing. All that stuff takes a ton of time. But if you're not starting with the right person and you don't know how to talk to them, A, even if they are good and you don't know how to talk to them, it's not going to work well. But B, if they're not, if they don't know marketing and you don't know what to ask, you're going to have a product that just doesn't work. And that's why I create Story Crews. I'm training businesses how to, to think about video and then find them the right people to execute those videos with them. Yeah. I mean, it's only expensive if they don't get return. But if it's properly serving the purpose, it's an investment. then it pays for itself. I, we have clients that we made videos for eight, nine, 10 years ago. They're still using them. They're still making them money, still getting, you know, I had a client recently say, you know, I got... $15,000 patient on a video that we made eight years ago, hmm. right? Think about that return on investment. You know, even if you spent $10,000 on that one video, that's still in like a 20 to one return on investment. I'm not doing the math right. I'm not, I, I, but, it, and you did, he didn't spend that much on that video. You know, it spent a lot less than that. So you're thinking 101 return on investment and on top of all the other stuff, you know, um, there's, I, I will, I do want to hear the dolphin story at some point. So I forgot <laughs> about it. It's a bit in big, you know, well, I, I got take 10 notes. minutes. If you see, yeah, if you see this, I have dolphin written across the top. So I don't forget. But what are some, you know, from the agency side of things, mm -hmm. you know, someone's running a business or agency, let's talk about what are some of the big mistakes or, or needle movers for you over the past over a decade of running an agency? You know, uh, um, I mean, number one is you should be hiring and asking for help, especially early on coaches, consultants, but you need to find people that have a done it multiple times and B helped other people multiple times. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, I, I, and not to slant on anyone, but if you've run an agency for two years, three years, and now you're going to go coach people on how to run an agency and you've never run it through a recession, you've never Three years, you have not gone through the, I don't care how big your agency is, you have not gone through the business of it. So if you're learning from someone like that, you're going to have trouble. But there's people like Jason Swank out there. There's people like yourself when it comes to podcasting, You've done it for years and helped multiple, multiple people. So find those coaches, find those consultants and listen to them. Get targeted on what you need to learn and work on individual pieces at a time. Another great book. The two, I mean, I wish I'd had Entrepreneurial Leap by Gina Wickman and, mm -hmm. at the beginning. If you're just getting started, even if you're a little bit in, listen to that. Yeah, he's a and master then, for sure. And then EOS and Rocket Fuel, you know, with Mark, yeah. Gino and, and Mark Winters. Awesome books. And, you know, developing that structure of meeting structure, who you're going to hire, your corporate structure um, was crucial, crucial, crucial. Niching down. It's hard to do it, but niche down. Um, and, you know, I wish I'd have done that earlier on. I guess I did, but I, re I you know, fought it. Um, and developing the systems. Developing systems is absolutely necessary because you cannot, like we were talking about it before, if you don't, you, you know, if you don't have a system, you can't expect people to do it. But, but you can get people with less talent that fit your core values and 
it, and if you have systems, you can train them up. And it's much easier than trying to find someone who's an expert that fits your core values because that's almost never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I love that advice of mentor. Find a mentor who's doing doing or has done exactly what you want to do. Yep. That's great advice. Thanks. And, and those books. Can't get enough of that on, on Audible. Yeah, I've listened to every single one of Gino Wickman's books for sure. And Mark Winters. Um, so, you know, I and I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been the lowest, what's been a low moment that you had to push through challenge moments and what's been a, a proud moment? Um, before you answer those two questions, um, I don't want to run out of time and not hear about the dolphin story <laughs> because it just, I don't even know the half of it. So I don't know if you, what you, where you want to start with that story, but um I teased in the beginning, but I want to hear, I want to hear what's going on with that. You want to hear the dolphin story? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you tell people this story. You probably don't. I don't even know how it came up. I, there's, I mean, you can look it up. There's a few, there's actually, there was talk about making a movie about this, but um, so my parents, I mean, my dad was an incredible entrepreneur, but we definitely went through, and that's part of like why I like helping small businesses because I went through the roller coaster my entire life. You know, ultra wealthy, ultra poor. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. I mean, up until when my dad passed away. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, my parents, my dad started, it was credited with bringing the Euro to the, making the first Euro distributorship, the, the sandwich in the United States in Chicago, where you live. Wow. Um, and I think the big company is still like that. The biggest company is still the company that they started and was absorbed. Wow. Uh, but then they took that money, started another restaurant called JJ Garlics, um, which really was uh, unique at the time, um, and it, which was super cool. I mean, all these famous people came in, and it was in Milwaukee, and so I grew up around that. But then the next thing that they did was they took and I mean, the restaurant about, business is tough, though. Oh, That's it's very tough, tough business. Yeah, very tough business. Very, very tough business. But my dad was a. My, it, didn't you know didn't give two f's about what other people thought b um was an innovator and c the hardest worker i knew so i mean he i mean it was a former marine on you know essentially he was a, a frogman in the marines an underwater demolitions expert which is pretty much a seal um so but what they did was they're in milwaukee there were public bathhouses nat natatoriums and so the city started destroying these and selling them off. So he bought one for really cheap. And so it's a giant building, two-story building with a giant pool. And that's where everyone would go take baths. So he made it into a restaurant, a two-story restaurant with super fine, crazy dining up above. I mean, it had like crazy How stuff. How old were you at the time? Do you remember? I was so five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So, so you I were younger. I, I was young. Um, but they decided to put live dolphins and live dolphin shows in the middle of, of this. And this is in so, Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So not Orlando, where you are now. This is not in Orlando. Where, yeah, we relive now. Uh, but in Milwaukee, you know, and okay, so Milwaukee was very is still an industrial town, but it was very industrial. You know, it's just at the end of the industrial revolution. So there's a lot of decline there. And it's very cold. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it can get 30 below zero with the wind chill, which, you know, you love that weather, Jeremy. No, I hate it. Yeah. Um, but so this was unusual. So they had what they did is they went out and figured out how you get to own dolphins. Like, that's not like something like you just go. Do you remember any of the conversations? You were really young of how did they even come up with that? It just seems like talk about marketer entrepreneur oh just yeah. thinking up ideas do you i don't know if you have any insights in how this the transformation of this evolution of this idea came about but anyways keep going so they decide we're going to do a dolphin show in they this pool in this restaurant they and did they had to yeah. get dolphins yeah they had to go get dolphins so i mean that's how we got to know orlando because we'd have to travel down to florida you have to you have to get certified dolphin trainers it's a federal license I mean, it's not like the, everyone's applying for these. So it's like he had a fear. And think about this. This is what amazes me when I think about it. it, it 
now on the internet, we can, it's like, oh yeah, you can figure that out. I can Google that. This was back in the day when, it, it, there, I mean, the, and there was no it's information the yellow on this. pages. Yeah. <laughs> Dolphin you trainer. Could, like, you couldn't even go to the yellow pages, right? So you had to go and like cold call SeaWorld, cold call Marine World and be like, hey, I want to come down and learn what you're doing and possibly hire and possibly lease some dolphins from you, you know, and think about how crazy people, you know, like, okay. Uh, but yeah. So and they actually they, pulled it off. Oh, they actually pulled it off. Wow. Um, it was super famous. If you look it up, if you Google a public natatorium, you'll you'll find stories about it. And I mean, they had not only that, they had like rare birds flying around. Um, when the dolphin show started, they actually would have these flower, hanging flower pots that would raise up two stories. And, and then there was a live dolphin show. It was pretty crazy. Wow. That's insane. It is. I mean, that would blow up on the social media today if someone actually did that in Milwaukee. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. So the last few minutes, you know, th thanks for sharing that story. I just I feel like it just shares the, you know, the um, visionary inspiration and what could other people be doing in their business that's just out of the box thinking to draw attention and attract um, people to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that maybe just is outside of your normal thinking. That's what I love about that. A restaurant that has a dolphin show in Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, in Milwaukee. <laughs> so what are, you know, maybe a challenge moment um, where you to push through and then we could talk about a proud moment. Uh, challenge moment in my current business? In your or career. No, in general. It could be currently. It could be um you know in the uh, you know, past like it's any, interesting. any moment you think I, i'm gonna make is... a yeah i'm gonna make a video about this but i mean because my office now where i'm sitting is actually two blocks almost exactly from my old house where i lived during 2001 so september 11th and you know that was definitely a tough tough time for me because you know i was a trader i was working for a hedge fund and you know, the market, you know, all of a sudden it's like, boom, everything's changed kind of like it is right now. Um, and they, you know, and I sat there and didn't know what to do. And instead of taking massive action, I, you know, was like afraid, scared. Um, I wasn't in the right state. And when I actually went back to trading, I just couldn't do it. I mm. just couldn't uh, because Why? And that's, it, it was just mentally out of it. It's like, what's this worth? You know, like, cause it, it like it, there were people that knew the world. You, well, literally, I mean, there's people I knew that were in the twin towers. Right. And, um, so it was very, very difficult to, for me, you know, because I didn't have like, I, I had a support system. It wasn't a massive support system. I had no tools. I, you know, I look back and I had ideas for businesses and I didn't take action. Those businesses would have been massive now if I could have taken action back then. Um, but yeah, I got really depressed, but I, you know, eventually got out of it and got back to work and fi finally got back to work and grew stuff and grew stuff and grew stuff. But that was definitely one of the tough spots. Hmm. Um, so I think most people remember where exactly they were when they saw that hit. Yeah. You know, whether they were on the, you know, scene or whether they were in New York or whether they were outside. I remember exactly where it was, you know, yeah. I saw it in those visuals over and over and over of the Twin Towers. I mean, I moved to New York a few years after that. It wasn't that long, you know, so it was like four years after that. And so, I mean, you would walk around and, and I worked in the East Village, so it was really close to Ground Zero. And you'd walk around and if if the plane flew low, everyone looked up. Like New Yorkers, someone could be on the fire on the ground and you would not notice them. So that was how difficult it was. So, um, yeah. But, you know, you, you push through. And, and now in this time, I, I was ready for this shift, you know. And it took that hardship to be ready for this shift. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm not that I'm happy about the pandemic and not that I'm, but any time that there's a major shift, there's huge, huge, huge opportunity. And that's why I'm, right now I'm so excited for all the businesses that are going to start. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited that we cut a lot of the, there's, there were a lot of businesses that shouldn't have been in business. I'm sorry. 
I was <laughs> driving around. I'm like, you should not have a business. But it was so frothy that they could, right? There was just so much money flying around. And that's why we're in this natural cycle. I get, I have an economics degree, so I get into that whole thing of the cycle. But uh, So, Ian, going from the low moment, mm -hmm. what's been a proud moment for you that you could be recent? Business-wise or personal could be could be either business or personal for you what sticks out as something that you know you especially are proud of i mean my favorite times are always when i help someone and they take the you know we help a business mm -hmm. and it's like oh i owe my business to you though that always mm -hmm. is the best or yeah. someone takes action and they get that first client mm -hmm. because of their video well, full they, circle like maybe uh, someone you help with a case story that is like i maybe not owe my business to you but like i owe a lot to you for helping me with my business yeah i mean i have a lot of those and they're awesome i mean that's the best part it's because you transform lives when you walk in and someone's like hey i've got this house because of you or mm. you know i mean that's that's fantastic you know when you like even when you say hey i thanks for your help we're able to do this because of that that makes me feel that's my proudest moment do you know you're you're affecting lives and you're transforming lives and that, that for me, and that's why part of the reason I'm doing story cruise too is yes, I want to help small business. And also I want to help other filmmakers that are entrepreneurs become, make money on a consistent basis and, and avoid the stuff that I, you know, went through. Ian, thank you. I want to be the my first pleasure. one to thank you. People should check out storycruise.com, giantsofvideo.com. Um, for, you know, the amazing people you have on around video and authentic web. Um, what final words do you have for us? Version done is better than version none. I love it. Get his t-shirt if he's selling it. Um, <laughs> Ian, thank you. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.